Hey, it's Joel Duff. Welcome back to my channel. And today, a little special episode of Critiquing Creationism. Last night, I appeared on the Standing for Truth YouTube channel, um, Q&A session after a discussion by a couple of young earth creationists about polystrate trees. And I had one particular question or point I wanted to make about a comment that was made during that time. I didn't necessarily want to get all involved in the polystrate uh, fossil thing. I'm going to have a separate video on that. Uh, kind of a complex topic, uh, but I had noticed something that I've talked a lot about on this particular channel, which is preserved footprints in the fossil record and what the implications of those footprints are toward uh, the global flood model of Earth's history. And so what I'm going to do here today is I am going to, uh, we're going to play this section in which I appeared on Standing for Truth's video uh, feed, and it's you know, maybe 10 minutes long, um, maybe a little bit apart, I'll skip through. But let's listen to the unfolding um, discussion I have with Paul Price and Ian Juby. Um, I'll say at, at the upfront, um, Paul Price and I have had, uh, you know, a little bit of back and forth in the past. I've never met Ian Juby. I found him really enjoyable to talk about, to talk to. Truly is fascinated by fossils. Uh, obviously has a lot of personal um, interaction and experience uh, with fossils in the geological column. Uh, he's been to uh, the Joggins uh, uh, fossil uh, beds, right, and seen many other fossils around the world. So I really appreciated his interaction um, that you're going to see here uh, from a creationist perspective. Uh, but really what I'm addressing is something that Paul Price brought up, which is the question of how easily footprints can be preserved in the fossil record. All right, I think that's uh, enough introduction. I'm going to show the video. We'll discuss. I'm going to react to it. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide the visual evidence to what I just did with my hand-waving motions in this particular video. I'm telling Paul Price about various places where human footprints have been preserved uh, as long as, as well as a lot of other footprints have been preserved. And I'm going to show him a couple pictures. Uh, I hope, Paul, I hope you're watching. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of the places that I've mentioned there and add a little bit more detail about how these uh, footprints could be preserved in the fossil record for us and talk about the, a little bit about the statistics or what the chances of this happening. Uh, could be and answer uh, his question a little more fully about, well, how is this relevant? I mean, essentially, that's what it comes down to at the end of it. You kind of like, what's relevant about uh, the fact that fossil footprints or footprints are being preserved today in sediments? All right. I said I would stop talking. We go to the video and I haven't done that yet. So let's proceed. Let me do. Okay, perfect. And now we have uh, Joel directly interacting on deck. We've got org. So we got a good group of skeptics, uh, well qualified uh, individuals. So, Dr. Duff, appreciate you being here. Certainly not your first time here uh, on one of our Standing for Truth open mic. So, I do appreciate your interaction. Joel, how you doing tonight? Real quick intro, and what would you like to discuss? Yeah, hey, I'm doing great. And um, thanks, gentlemen. This is a really interesting conversation. Um, and I'm, I'll, I'll keep it short. I just want to do. Uh, Paul had brought up something about, you know, the, the footprints and, and was asking about, like, how could those footprints be preserved? And I, I think that um, he brings up a very natural, um, uh, I think, a natural idea that many people have, right? I mean, I think everybody experiences, you know, you, you walk on a beach, you walk even on mud and you see your footprints and they're going to be washed away. I mean, they're not going to survive. Um, and so I hear all the, I hear that all the time. They, they they can't be preserved. Like how else would they be preserved? And and maybe a, a global flood would instantly preserve them by covering them as soon as that they are laid down. But there are billions of fossil footprints, right? Not just in the flood record, but in the post flood record. Now I don't know what your exact position is on where the flood post flood boundary is. I know that there's lots of debate among younger creationists. But even if you have it in the, I'd say a, a high flood. Uh, or a high boundary marker, I would still say that there are many billions of fossil footprints that are present in post-flood mm -hmm. rocks. So we know that a non-global flood situation can preserve fossil footprints, including humans. So I, uh, I've, you know, 
I'd been to uh, Death Valley, um, and there there was a sand. There's sand dunes at the bottom of the Death Valley in one area, and you can see where there a large sand dune is blowing away, and below it is this bud substrate which is hardened, and on that I saw. I can show you pictures you know, of that a, site. A, a whole minutes. trackway of like 20 boot prints. Now, I don't know when those boot prints are laid down, but it could have been years before. Um, and then the sand covers them up and they're leaving. And then that sand's probably going to cover them again. And then, you know, it gets wet and there's more deposition. Potentially someday, those boot prints could end up being in the fossil record. Now, 0 0.00, I mean, 99.99999% of all the footprints that we ever would ever lay down, that any of us or any animal would ever step on the earth and do anything with are going to be, they're going to be eroded, no doubt about it. But all it takes is 0.000001% of footprints to survive under some condition, even if it's a fairly rare condition, for us to have billions of footprints present in the fossil record without floods, without global floods, even without local floods. There are human footprints that have been found on sand dunes that are preserved in South Africa, in Spain, uh, in the Southwest. If you go to the, the White Sands uh, National Monument, you probably, uh, surely you've heard of the fossil footprint tracks there where we have traced a person who has walked, you know, thousands of footprints, walked back and met a sloth, or didn't actually, in that case, not met a sloth, but a sloth passed over that particular trackway. And we think that that happened thousands of years ago, and yet their footprints are there readily for us to see. So the, the argument that, you know, footprints will just get washed away, that needs to be some sort of really quick preservation of it, is, is not really accurate. Um, yes, there need to be some preservation. You usually have to step in some sort of mud, which has to be consolidated enough for you to actually leave the footprint to begin with. And then you're going to have, if it dries out, as you have in seasonal places where, you know, you have a springtime flood or springtime wet wetland, um, and then when the floods come back or, or the, the water returns, it's going to bring a little bit of sediment, fill up those layers. That's how I would also visualize those dinosaur footprints being preserved as well. You find on these thin layers, you know, and, it, it, you know, I, I recognize that, um, I mean, Ian, I think that's a, you know, I think your, um, I think your title, you know, idea would have some merit there in terms of like, Look, you've got you got this washing in and out and over this particular uh, set of foot, set of footprints that are laid down. I think the one negative there would be um, if that's on sand. Well, sand can consolidate fairly quickly, and you can step on it like you know we can walk on a beach, right? But if it's on mud, if it's on mudstone, you know if you have mud, uh, a dinosaur stepping in the mud isn't going to leave a very clear footprint. They're just going to sink into it. In a global flood scenario, you're going to have a large swaths of of dense of material that's not dewatered and therefore it's going to be hard to hold or sort of hold the weight mm. of the animals walking on it. So that's one particular challenge and that's a challenge that I think I think most of you know has come out in the young earth creationist literature itself recently with that particular challenge of how does the how do the muds get um, consolidated in order for these footprints to be preserved. But anyway, that that's my that's really my only thing is to just let people know that there are enormous numbers of footprints of all different types that are found throughout the fossil record. Although there is a pattern to it. I mean, there's certain kinds of footprints that aren't found deep in the fossil record, but um, we have abundant evidence that virtually every organism that's on this earth has the potential to leave footprints in the fossil record. Although, you know, because if you have a population of a million individuals, they're going to make trillions of footprints. So only a few of them need to be preserved for us to, to see them someday. Okay, Joel, That's I appreciate all. that. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, Paul, yeah. Ian, we'll give you as much time just, as you need to respond. I, I just wanted to ask him about the Death Valley footprints. Can I find them? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been there yet. Well, I don't know. Maybe they're eroded, but they're in the... Um, I, and the thing is, there's... They're in the area just, uh, I forget what the name of that is, but it's where the big sand dunes are. And then okay. there's a there's an area of sand, stovepipe wells. I think it's the parking lot, stovepipe oh, wells. Yes. Okay. And you walk out there and you kind of meet where the sand dunes are kind of meeting where the, where the, where the land is. 
And there they're kind of just moving around all the time. They're sort of like uncovering some plants. And then you'll see some of those they're really cool plants there, right? Because they have their, their roots are way down in there, but then they get all the sand blown out from underneath them and they're kind of standing on stilts. So, cool. <laughs> okay, you know, cool. Well, there, there's your, you know, they'll be polystrate fossils some days, I guess, you know, if they get, keep getting covered and then they grow a little higher and then they keep getting covered and they try to grow up a little higher. Um, and they're really tough plants. So they're not going to be killed off by, uh, you know, a single, uh, you know, see a, a storm of sand covering them up. You know, why don't I stop right there for just a minute? Um, uh, there's there's going to be more conversation with Paul Price coming up in a few minutes. So we're going to explore this idea of fossil footprints or reserve footprints in the present. Uh, quite a bit more here. But since uh, Ian had just asked me about the footprints in Death Valley, how about I go and I show you those first? Because that's what I wanted to show Paul is that I've seen footprints like in the action of being preserved. All right, so for example, here I am standing on one of the salt flats uh, in one of the lowest places of Death Valley. That's my son way off in the distance there. Uh, and what we're doing is we're just, we're there actually in the spring, not long after it had rained. So there's actually a pool out there, which is what the, the slight bit of reflection in it, um, that you can see there. Uh, and so we're walking around on this crust, it's basically a salt crust that's on a, on, on top of mud. And once in a while we're breaking through and we're, we're not leaving much of a footprint because of how hard the sediment is here. Um, but there are clearly other places where we walked across this area and we've left our boot prints there. And then the question is, how long would they last? Right? And the vast majority of those boot prints that we left there no longer exist. <laughs> I mean, they got um, churned up, you know, just by salt heaving the soil. Uh, they got washed away in the next layer of sediment that came down. Other individuals stepped on our footprints multiple times and basically mashed them out of existence, right? So there's no doubt that the vast majority, if not all, of our footprints are completely gone from a couple of years ago. But as we're walking around, and this is this is actually a different trip to the to the um, um, Death Valley I, I took with my father, uh, and here we're looking at the sand dunes near Stovepipe Wells. And as we're walking up to those sand dunes, the first sand dunes, we're walking on this sort of hard clay pan. Uh, this is very hard soil, not rock, just a very hard soil, very, very really cemented. Um, um, I guess it would be originally it would have been mud, right? Fine grained material. And I look down and I see this very clear boot print. Uh, in front of me. In fact, I'm wearing boots and the boots are about the same size. I mean, it almost looks like somebody who had the same boots that I had on, you know, stepped right here. And I wondered like, you know, the first thing that came to my mind was like, how old is that? Because of course, that's the way my mind works, right? I'm always interested in that type of question. So I'm looking at that. And I'm thinking, when did somebody step right there? When did it last rain? Now, eventually I went back and, and when we had visited uh, it had been at least a couple months since they had any significant rainfall uh, at this particular location. So it's probably been several months since this spot would have been wet in order to be able to handle, in order to be able to provide the environmental conditions for this particular footprint to have formed. And then I started looking around a little bit more. And what we see is this, this whole area is this, uh, it was scoured off uh, with this hard crust all right, of mud that had clearly, the, clearly had rained quite a bit, gotten the top layer of the sediments wet. And they were already this uh, fine grade material. And that then kind of cemented together into this hardened mud. And then you see there's a little bit of a sand dune there. What you can't see in this picture is off to a little bit farther to the left um, is a much larger sand dune that's kind of creeping in on this area. And so I saw that footprint and the, the one in the foreground there where I have my, uh, my lens cap, that one is the one that's really clear that I saw first. And then I started looking around and I realized, oh, there's a whole row of footprints. And what I'm not showing you here is there's actually a continuance of that row uh, back behind me. I think there was something like 12 or 13 footprints that, that I could clearly uh, demarcate uh, as being these mud, mud prints. And then they go right up to the sand and I would presume that if I brush the sand off there, 
that there would be a set of footprints going underneath that sand dune, right? So that sand dune is creeping over and covering over these footprints. Now, again, how old are the footprints? I don't know. Maybe they're less than a year old. Maybe they're only several months old. But they also might be from last summer. They could be from the year before. They could have been laid down at some point, and then the sand could have covered them, and then the sand's been blown off, and the sand's been blown back on. And the point is that mud, very likely these footprints are not going to last, right? They're not going to last decades. Probably the wind scouring this could scour this right away. But it's also possible it could get covered. It could get, it could get covered. Sorry, I can't speak today. It could get covered up by, you know, more sand. And if the sand doesn't depart and much more sand gets put on top of this, eventually we're, we're in a basin here. There can be more sand, more erosion from, well, they've had some very large storms, right, in the last year out there in Southern California that have brought enormous amounts of material back down into the valley. It's possible this location might have a couple feet of new mud sitting on top of it, in which case now those footprints are encased inside of other layers of sediment. And if more material keeps getting placed on top of that, eventually you're going to have enough compaction, enough weight there, enough percolating um, liquid, right, water moving down through that solution that you're going to begin to cement those small grains of material together and you're going to lithify all that material and it's going to become rock. And the layer of mud that gets laid on top of these particular footprints is going to have just a little bit different texture, right? Right. The, the characteristics of it are going to be a little bit different, and chances are it's going to fracture at this point right where the footprints are. And so potentially somebody will break open a future rock and find boot prints there, right? Not just you know our footprint, but the, the boot print of somebody who wore that boot at some particular date and time. Right? So that's just a really uh, simple example of how footprints can get preserved in an environment today. This did not require a local flood. Now, maybe some kind of small flood might be necessary to bring enough debris, right, new mud to lay on top of that. Really might not be a whole lot. Um, and that would be a very, very temporary, very local flood that could cause that to happen. Certainly not talking about the necessity of a global flood to instantly pervert, uh, preserve these. These footprints could lay exposed to the surface for months at a time and still be viable uh, in a location like this. All right, and since we're talking Death Valley, um, just a little ways away from that, uh, again, I, it had been several months since it had rained there, and we'd driven up into a little bit of a valley, and we found this uh, area where obviously there had been a, a bunch of water had come down through one of the crevices, dragged out a whole bunch of sediments in there, formed a mud flow, that mud flow that had spread out and now it had dried. And so this has been dry for multiple months. Uh, and you can see from my own boots here, the size of the cracks that are in this mud. And so this might get eroded if it rains again and water erodes this away, but it could also be there might be another mud flow. And if there's another mud flow, that mud is gonna come over top of this mud flow and then grains of that mud flow are going to settle into the cracks of this one. And if that gets laid on top and then there's more layers laid on top of that, potentially this also becomes a, a type of fossil, right? A top of a representation of a past climate where these mud cracks tell us that there was a, this was once wet material that dried and then cracked as, as it contracted uh, over time. Right? And this is something we see throughout the geological column. Right? There's many different places where we see something that looks like mud cracks that have been filled. And those mud cracks would usually are going to represent uh, an environment where there is mud at the surface that then has to spend some time completely dewatering, right? drying out. Uh, in a place like Death Valley, this might really only be four or five days in order to get to the point where you've completely dried out the top surface of the mud and, and created these cracks. Uh, in other locations, it might be a lot longer. Nonetheless, it, it accounts for the passage of time before you can have another event, which would be the event that then covers over 
uh, these particular locations and preserves them uh, the way we see them. All right, let's do a little bit more of the video and then we'll come back and we'll look at these really cool elephant footprint tracks. Right. I have a question for Dr. Duff real quick. Thank you. So the, you brought up the white sands fossil footprints and apparently this is something I hadn't heard about. So I'm interested to, to look more into this myself. But Super cool. Yeah, it says they're fossilized human footprints. And so my well, understanding fossilized is with quotes around it. So what do we what do we mean? This is my question is what is your proposed method of preservation here? Like what is the what is the explanation you have for how like what what does it mean to say that these are fossilized footprints? Now, of course, my answer is going to be kind of similar to what I just showed at Death Valley. You know, the original preservation process is going to start out as mud, sediment, someone's footprint, making an impression. And then right away, it just doesn't turn to stone, right? That's why I'm saying, in quotes, fossilized. Right? We talk about fossilized footprints, or I, I, better to say preserved footprints. And then you should ask the question, well, preserved as what? Right? Preserved uh, in as hardened mud, you know, preserved as uh, you know, stone, preserved as petrified material. I mean, there's all different types of preservation we think of as, with fossils. Um, and I think that that's what Paul's getting at. He wants to say, like, well, what do you mean by fossilized? Because I think he recognizes, like, those footprints, like, on a mud surface are not fossils yet because he thinks of fossils as being complete replacement of the original parts, like a dinosaur bone. Um, and that's why that's one of the confusions uh, often young earth creationists have, or at least they, at least with the terminology. Uh, so they look at things like remains of organic materials in dinosaur bones, right? Like some pieces of collagen, and they'll say, "Well, that's unfossilized," right? Versus, "Well, it's not fossilized." Uh, well, there's still a form of fossilized, you know, proteins. Because they're not the original proteins. They've been manipulated to a great extent, right? The bonds have been shifted around and they've created new bonds and they've formed new structures. So it hasn't been replacement of the material necessarily, but it has been a change in the material over what the original material was. And so it's not the original material. It's not the original molecular conformation of that collagen. The collagen has been reconfigured in terms of its molecular bonds to form a much more stable structure, which is why, which is what allows it to survive for, for millions of years. But I'm getting myself off track. Let's continue here. How are they preserved? Well, it, in, in that case, you have, uh, that's, a, that's a very uh, flat lake bed there. Um, and you had times where you had thousands of acres covered by very thin amount of water during the during the spring uh, floods that come down from the mountain because it's a, that place is just surrounded by mountains and it all just gets trapped there right there's no exit um, to that uh, and so as that water dries up you had this mud flat and we can see that somebody walked from one side where they had you know above the water level well, I would say. One area where a little higher elevation where they were uh, apparently living or doing something, right? They had a camp. And then they walked across this mud flat all the way over to the other side where there was, again, higher elevation in order to, and, and, and the actual, the, the proposal is that because of the way that this individual, this they think was a female, the way she was, the way the footprints work is there's a more deeper impression from the left side than the right. I can't remember if it was right or left but it suggests that she was carrying a baby or carrying some kind of weight on one side because then the footprints come back across to the other side again. So the return trip, in that case, it looks like the same person because the footprints are the same size, but, they don't, but they're not set into the soil the same amount. And so it looks like they dropped something off and then came back. And then on the trip out, um, there, weren't, there wasn't a sloth but on the trip back, there was sloth's footprints that stepped on one of the human footprints and kept on going. And then when she came back, she stepped over that particular spot. So yeah, it's a really I mean, interesting, really interesting recreation of, of the historical events there. Now, I know you're asking about like, how do they get preserved? Well, I mean, that mud dries up through the, the dry summer, right? And hardens. 
And then next year you get all this sand and silt that comes in, comes in with the dirty, muddy water that comes in. And then it settles out on top of those footprints and leaves another two or three inches of, of sediment there. And see, they have footprints, not just from one level, they have footprints from multiple different layers. There's one site, I haven't, had made, haven't made a video about it yet. But there's one site where there's like six different layers of sediment and there's footprints on different layers. So this is a place where people lived and they, every season, they ended up walking on that same area on the yeah. same mud that's and, there. And, and to be honest, for all I know, the explanation you're giving there would be agreed on by all parties because- Yeah, I think so. This is okay, since we're talking white sands, let's go and look at that paper because I looked it up afterwards. Uh, I still want to make a whole video on the white sands footprints. There's all kinds of interesting stories there. But for Paul, I can give you a really quick snapshot of this. Okay, so here we are. We're in the journal uh, Science from 2023, uh, October. So this is just six months old here. Independent age estimates resolve the controversy of ancient human footprints at White Sands. There's been multiple different people who have studied this particular site and tried to figure out how old the footprints are. Uh, and one group had suggested that the, the date was, uh, was it 13,000 years or something like that? And another group was suggesting it was around 21 to 23,000 years old, which would clearly make them like the oldest footprints um, that have ever been found in North America or really in the New World. Um, at all. But let's not quibble over the dates here. Uh, I really just want to show you this picture right here. So hopefully we can see this here. But these arrows are pointing to the human footprints. And you can see how they really are amazingly clear, amazingly sharp footprints um, that are in these, uh, embedded in these sediments. Um, now this is in, in the white sands. This is um, there's a high salt content inside of these sediments because these are these are very thin layered uh, sediments that were laid down in a very flat basin uh, area between two mountain ranges. Uh, and But the notable thing about this particular image is that we have footprints up here, right? And then we've they've dug down to another layer below that. And here are a series of footprints going in a different direction. And then we dig down to a couple layers below. There's another couple footprints here, which really aren't, you can't make out very well, but these little yellow arrows point to them. And then down here in a yet deeper layer, we see very clear evidence of other footprints down here. And so we have, in this image alone, we have four different levels of sediments, all right? Four different deposits, each of which have their own human footprints on top of them. And then if we scroll down here, we see that overall in this, in this area that they investigated, uh, and there's, there's many, many different areas in the White Sands uh, region that have footprints of both human footprints, but then lots of other footprints of elephants, of sloths, um, you know, wolves. I mean, the works, right? There's lots of footprints uh, in this area, probably hundreds of thousands of footprints surely, surely preserved just in this one lake system. But here we have a cross section showing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different layers with human footprints that have been identified uh, at this location. And what's really cool here is this indentation at the top is a proboscidean, right? An elephant, right? Probably a mastodon uh, or mammoth. There's both mammoths and mastodons uh, in this region at the time. And so you have an actual mastodon foot that has stepped on the sediments above the seven layers of human footprints, All right? So there must have been multiple different seasons and times in which you had mud laid down or siltstone or clays. I mean, these are a variety of different forms of, of, of sediments depending on probably the amount of water that came and the amount of sediment that it dragged through and how long, it, how long that pool of shallow water sat there and, and material dropped out of it, that would determine the types of characteristics of these layers of, of deposits. But you had seven different layers in which you had distinguishable human footprints. And then on top of that, at some later point, you had this, this elephant uh, track. Now, of course, elephants have been extinct from North America for a, a really long time. Uh, and so here you have elephants 
clearly in this location after human beings had already been there for quite some time. Um, yeah, and then what you're seeing there is also the dates. They've done a whole bunch of dating methods with various seeds and other organic materials that they have found in those layers. Uh, and so, you know, if you want to use, say, Nathaniel Jenkins' conversion factor for carbon-14 dating and turning it into the biblical chronology dating, uh, the 21,000 would be approximately about 4,000 years ago. This means people had to get off the ark, go to Babel, leave Babel, and make it all the way to this area of New Mexico. Um, and they had to be there long enough to experience at least seven different flooding stages in order to, and that, you know, after those floods, it's not like they just walk out into um, the, the water and leave these tracks as easily as they could. These tracks are very distinguishable in terms of the, the features of the feet. And so this would have been when the rock, when the mud, not underwater, but has, is exposed to the surface and is drying out and dried to the stage where you would walk across it and not just leave milky footprints, but you just be impressions uh, right in the mud as you're going along. So yeah, that's, just a, that's just a brief snapshot of the white sands footprints. I'm not showing you the one with the sloth, um, but there's also lots of different elephants uh, footprints there as well. And I am seeing in this particular example, the elephant walked on top of layers that had human footprints in it, but we also have layers in which the same layer has human footprints and elephant footprints and human footprints and sloth, uh, giant sloth of footprints in the same layers. But let's go back to the video, see what else we can uh, glean from that. Post-flood. <laughs> definitely be post-flood in any case. But yeah. it's just interesting because water has to be involved. Everyone agrees that water has to be involved because that's what permineralization requires. It requires the, you know, infiltration of minerals that are dissolved in water to permeate something. So, you know, even if the mud dries out, that in itself does not produce a fossil because all you'll get is a, a cracked, you know, a cracked hard piece of mud that is brittle. You would still need an, an additional process to oh, turn yeah. hardened mud from hardened mud into an actual fossil. And that process still requires water. So every, everyone seems to agree that the fossil record was laid down by water. We're, we're just, the only thing we're disagreeing on. Um, no. <laughs> fossil record wasn't all laid down by water. I just showed you Death Valley, all right? Now there, yes, there was uh, maybe some rain involved that got the floor of the valley wet that allowed the footprints to be made. And then for them to get covered over, I'm not necessarily saying you had to have a flood to cover them. Maybe it would help to have some kind of uh, mud flow come over and cover those tracks at some point before they erode in order to preserve them. But a sand dune, and there are footprints, I am sure, under that sand dune there. If that sand dune doesn't move and it simply grows and there's more and more sand there and eventually sand piles up, right, that sand eventually is going to lithify. Now, it'll probably need some water to do that, right? You're going to have to have some water percolating through that, which is going to bring various minerals in there, which are going to help cement those, uh, those molecules, those sand grains together. Right? So in that sense, you need water, but you wouldn't necessarily need it to be flooded with water. Right? It doesn't have to be underwater. Right? There are massive sand dunes that are preserved for us in the fossil record. Uh, and although young earth creationists will point to them and, say, and try to argue that they're all produced somehow underwater themselves, um, we see huge sand dunes. We see sand dunes out in you know, the Sahara. And if you were to go to the Sahara, we have what are called petrified sand dunes there. Right? We have places where sand dunes have been in place in one spot for so long, it literally cemented themselves together just by virtue of the fact of being not moving. Right? And not moving, you know, there's still some action of molecules, and they are gluing themselves together as they sit there. Now, part of that's helped by, you know, it does rain once in a while there. And so that is going to help that process. But it doesn't have to be covered with water. So these. Death Valley spots, 
can be covered up with sand. And if enough sand gets covered on top of that and it sits long enough, you're eventually going to have a hardened dune. Go look at Mars. All right, I've been showing a lot of stuff on Mars here. There's sand ripples, and they look like sand dunes. They're just kind of blowing there. But then when the rover comes up to it and finds out they actually have a thick crust on them, they're hard. Uh, the, the, it can break through them at different times. So it's basically the top layer has been sitting for so long, potentially thousands, if not tens of thousands of years, without, without enough wind to move that sand. And as a result, they have cemented themselves together, and they've done it without any rain. Right? They have done it without any water. Um, now, I mean, there can be a slight bit of water, you know, in the air and so forth. And so the sand dunes can, you know, some of those particles in the sand dunes can probably absorb water from the air. And so they're gradually doing that and helping them to glue themselves together. It's an incredibly slow process on the face of Mars. Nonetheless, you can have petrification of those sand dunes. Um, and like I said, in Sahara, there are petrified sand dunes there by virtue of the fact that some of them have been buried by other larger sand dunes for so long that they're now no longer just piles of sand anymore. Um, and, and that's, by the way, how I'm, I'm going to show later some actual footprints in sand dunes themselves, human footprints, where humans have left footprints in sand dunes and they've become rocks. So not just in mud and then, well, I haven't seen the mud actually turn into a fossil, right? It hasn't been completely petrified. Uh, but no, we do have examples of human footprints in rocks, right? Completely preserved in rock material, completely lithified material. Norm, Back to the video. Is the time it took to do it? Yeah, and in this case, I'm, no one's claiming that these footprints are in rock. I mean, these are in I'm going to show some, but not the ones I've talked about. Lithified soils at this point, right? There is some lithification going. You know, it's harder than just you know it was muddy yesterday. You can't just take your can't just take your shovel out there and dig through this. It takes some real you know work to get out these different layers. Um, the idea would be that uh, this is still a basin. There's still more sediment that's being deposited there, and it's going to continue to deposit. I don't know over tens of thousands of years. There could be dozens of feet, if not hundreds of feet of sediment on top of what are now are these preserved footprints underneath them. You're right, as, as water uh, filters through all that and the whole set of sediments becomes lithified, eventually that could be rock, in which case someday there'll be footprints discovered in the rock. That's why I'd suggest looking at the South African example or the, the one in, um, we'll in Spain, because those are absolutely those are preserved sand dunes that are rock i mean they're hard rock and yet you can see human footprints in that sand dune somebody stepped on that sand dune when it was wet left their impression the sand dune dried and then more sand blew over the top and then filled in those footprints and then more sand piled on top of that till you eventually had an entire yeah. preserved sand dune system that then turned into rock. And now as it's eroding, we see those human footprints come out. Yeah, and, and I think what, what you're doing is illustrating the point I tried to make earlier, which is that what we're, we're approaching this, you know, in, in historical science, we're looking at the present clues and we're trying to piece them together uh, what we believe the past events were. And there's no question that with any particular piece of evidence, you can come up with an explanation that fits the time scale you're you're looking at or that you want it to to use to explain it but i think what ian and i are arguing tonight is that not not that there's any one particular piece of evidence that proves that the bible's history about the the global flood is true and it, it's like a magic bullet piece of evidence it's a a smoking gun as uh, dr carol cleland said i think the argument really is that you get an overall picture when you look at the full picture that is more indicative of the Bible's history than it is with Charles Lyell's history and James Hutton's history and Charles Darwin's history. And that's the argument that I think uh, we're making here tonight. It's not that we've, we're, we're trying to show a gotcha. Well, see, this proves the Bible because we found a polystrate fossil. It's rather... Uh, you know, 
look at the overall scope of evidence, and I think you you see over. Okay, so now what Paul's doing here is he's, I mean, he's generally kind of moving off script here. Actually, he's moving on to his usual script, sort of the, you know, what's historical science versus observational science. And, and yes, we can kind of admit like these things happen, you know, okay, so footprints happen. He is begrudgingly, he's kind of begrudgingly admit, admitting that, yes, footprints are formed. That's kind of really my only point. That's my really only point for, for showing up here is because he had, he had suggested, he had really given the impression to his audience when talking about some of the footprints um, at the at the Joggin site, which was the primary discussion, was this this thing is this thing's really about polystrate trees. But during his discussion of polystrate trees, he made comments about preserved footprints or fossilized footprints, as if like, you know, how could footprints actually form? I mean, th there's no way you could actually get a snapshot of something so ephemeral, right? You walk around on sand and they're gone within minutes. So the only way that um, that they can be preserved is that there is some unusual event, right? You, you have a, a giant flood. You, you walk across a surface and all of a sudden another layer of sediment is poured right on top of it and just preserves those footprints uh, for us. Um, and emphasizing that you have to have a flood in order to create these footprints. I only came on to make this solitary single point, which is footprints can be formed, not necessarily in watery conditions, right? That was the whole point of the, of the Death Valley thing, right? Those things, that's a dry environment and, and footprints are being formed there, right? Or being preserved there. Uh, and there's many, many other locations in the world where Millions of footprints are being preserved all the time. Now, not all of them are going to survive. Some of them are going to erode over the next decades or so forth, but some of them are going to survive and be preserved in the geological column. Uh, and it didn't require global floods. It doesn't even require local floods in order to preserve this. And that's really all I was trying to uh, have Paul understand because he was presenting it as if that can't happen, all right? Or at least that he doesn't understand how that could happen. Um, but now he's going off on like, well, you know, that's, you know, how good of it, that's not really evidence against a, a, a young earth, so why are you talking about this? Well, I did have a second point, and that had to do with the statistics. And he's gonna go uh, talk about my statistics in a moment here. So we'll come back and I'll make my second point about statistics and how they actually do speak directly against a young earth model um, of the of the earth but let's get back to the video whelming evidence of a global flood and honestly my opinion is that if it weren't for the spiritual ramifications behind that claim there wouldn't be a, a scientist on this planet that would have a problem with it they would readily admit it in fact uh you know this argument is just really ridiculous that um, if it weren't for the spiritual ramifications, if it weren't that people are denying God, if they weren't that the Bible is telling them that the world was young, if they didn't have that, if they didn't feel like they were opposing God, then they would readily recognize that the world is young. I'm sorry, there's many, many scientists who don't know anything about the Bible and have come to recognize that the world is old. They don't, they don't, obviously recognize the world as being young, right? There aren't other people in other religions that are recognizing that the world is young, right? They're not trying to deny the Bible. Confucianists are not uh, like, oh, we, we don't want to accept this Bible's version of, of the origins of the world, and therefore we're going to obscure all the data. And I would point out, it's really many, many Christians through time that have developed and come to... Uh, have brought the evidence that the world is old, right? They really struggled with this because they thought that their interpretation of scripture was that the world was young. And they really struggled with the fact that they were not seeing that in the actual evidence. They weren't blinded, they weren't blinded by the, by the, the forces around them. They were wanting to find that evidence, but couldn't find that evidence and that support uh, for a young earth. So anyway, his, his whole like, conspiracy theory that simply Erwin's eyes are shielded to the, the real truth of a young earth is, is not a, uh, a very good argument here. They're talking about 
Oh, uh, it looks like maybe, I forget whether it was Mars. It might have been Mars. It looks like there was evidence for a global flood on Mars. And then they start talking about the same lines of evidence that we creationists use to show a global flood here on Earth. And they got no problem okay. flying to Mars. But on Earth... Yeah, the Ark in the Darkness, the recent video, the recent movie I just went to see, that was a big thing in there about how like, oh, look, you know, scientists are willing to accept a flood on Mars because it, it doesn't... Uh, um, it doesn't uh, go against this biblical worldview. But when you talk about it on the earth, well, oh, no, no, we can't have a flood here because that would be, that would be ridiculous. We can't, we can't accept that here. Um, those two things are completely different. Different floods, different times, different conditions, right? It's not apples to apples. But I also would ask a question of Paul. I mean, if he thinks, if he really thinks that there was a flood on Mars, actually go watch my videos about Mars and about the topology of Mars and all the layering on Mars uh, and all that. And his flood argument, if he thinks there was a flood on Mars, he's got a lot of explaining to do. Um, but one big thing that I don't think I've mentioned in those videos would be, where did all the water go? I mean, people ask about that, about the earth. And in this Ark in the Darkness, you know, that was a main question that was asked of the experts there. And of course they said, well, look at how much water there is on the earth already. The water didn't go anywhere. It's still here. Well, if Mars was covered with water, there's a real question. Where did the water go? Well, we know where the water went. The water went out into the outer space. But there's some really basic formulas you can use in terms of the escape rate of how fast water could move through the atmosphere and then escape into outer space. I mean, we know that water is escaping in outer space, even here on Earth. Um, and it is escaping into space from Mars. But if you do some simple calculations of what the max amount of water vapor there would be that could escape at any one time, either today or in the past, not nearly enough. 4,000 years isn't nearly enough for Mars to have lost all of its water to outer space. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm off on a tangent. I'll throw in one more little tangent, little tidbit here. And it is something I've mentioned on some of the other videos. But the, the other thing about the water on Mars is that uh, had there been that much water on Mars, and it would have taken, like I said, would have taken a long time to evaporate. Um, we also know from historical records that people have been looking at Mars, like the ancient Egyptians, so we're talking 4,000 years or a little bit more, right? Basically, the time of the biblical flood, according to young Earth creationists. And when they looked up and they looked at the stars and they noticed one particular star, it was the red planet, all right? It's been recognized as being a red planet for a very long time, all ever since that, that planet has been seen and noticed, it's been red. It's red because of the oxidation. The lack of water on the surface right, results in the red color that it has. So all the water had to have escaped, what, instantly after the flood? Uh, that's another thing young Christians need to work on if they really want to use this flood argument like Paul's trying to use here. Um, they need to have some way that all that water could have just disappeared off the face of, the, uh, off the face of Mars. And besides, why would God flood Mars at the same time he flooded Earth? Is it truly a universal flood, not just a, a global flood? All the flood, all this Mars stuff is, is a red herring in this, particular, um, in this particular argument here. Earth, it doesn't work because on Earth, that would have spiritual ramifications that people don't want. Uh, and Conspiracy Ian, I, I want to make sure I'm not taking away any chance for you to speak. I know no, I don't want to no. talk over you, but do you have anything you want to add? No, no. I, Other than if you're going to dig down with a shovel to the footprints, do it fast and run because they get real mad at you when you do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've I, been, I've I, tried I, to go there. You're right. It, that's not, that site is not accessible. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes, I, I very much wanted to be, wanted to see those. Gentlemen, if, if I, Paul, I, I need to say ahead, something really quick. I'll make it really yeah. quick. Well, that's all good and well. That was well beyond anything that I was interested in talking about. My, I only had one point, and that was you talked about the footprints in the fossil record, and you made this statement about how, how else could those footprints have been formed other than a global flood. You were trying to ascribe the footprints to like necessitating a global flood. All I'm doing is providing examples of footprints not produced in a global flood or in a flood of any manner, really. 
And yeah, that's, that that's the totality. That's the totality of my point. Just so that you won't say that as if that's some kind of like great point for young earth creationism. That is a wash. Like I would say, like, you know, it doesn't help your case um, to say that. It just makes it look like you don't know about how footprints can be preserved. That, that, that's all that's all the only reason I'm here. Okay. I mean it it's it's an interesting point that you can point to some examples <laughs> where specific circumstances <laughs> uh, allowed for footprints to be preserved in the absence of a catastrophic, you know, flood. And that, that point is well taken. But I'm not sure that the specific circumstances okay, like so in well Sands I appreciate that. that you're appealing to in this case, I don't think you would be able to make a very good argument that those circumstances would be applicable, for example, at Joggins. And so while you might be able to point to some isolated places where we've not, seen not isolated. the formation of a footprint, I mean, your point is, yeah, it almost never happens, but because we're assuming billions of years of history, the, the point zero 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 one unlikely event suddenly becomes likely, right? And that's kind of the MO of evolution, no matter what the situation is, whether we're talking about mutations or, you know, fo footprints or whatever. It's always, yeah, it's unlikely, but we've got all the time in the world to play with, so the unlikely becomes inevitable. So. Thanks, Donnie. I got to run. All right, my pleasure, Thanks. Joel. Thank you for joining. Very interesting. Thanks, back. Okay, so we got two more skeptics. Okay, let's take it. Let's take care of the second point right away. All right, the one thing that I wasn't able to get to that I would have followed up with uh, Paul here. I knew I was short of time, and so there wasn't any point in trying to press this issue. Um, but Paul is is making the point, and I think he made a reasonable inference here. He's saying, "Look, you made an original argument that um, fossil footprints are extremely common." but they're very, 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 very rarely preserved. But the reason they're common is because there's a lot of time, right? You have the fossil record being produced over 500 million years, at least in terms of like vertebrates, uh, which are the types of footprints we're thinking about mostly. Uh, and so you have 500 million years, and over 500 million years, how many animals have lived on the Earth, right? quadrillions times quadrillions times quadrillions of animals, which have made quadrillions times quadrillions times quadrillions times another quadrillion of actual footprints on various surfaces. And so there are so, so, so many possible opportunities for fossilization that even if fossilization of any individual footprint is extremely unlikely, like I said, 0 0.0001, right? One in a quadrillion. You know, one in a quintillion, if you want to go that far, only one out of every quintillion actual footprints that are laid down end up being preserved. You're still going to, and I've done the math in another uh, video, you're still going to end up with billions of preserved footprints. Right. And so what Paul's making is actually a decent point here. He's saying like, well, so you need that much time. Right. That's essentially what he's saying. He's like, you, you need that much time in order to produce that many footprints. And I think what he's saying is, what he's thinking is that, oh, well, a global flood um, is going to preserve a much higher percentage of footprints, right? Because you have animals running around, presumably on surfaces that are, you know, there's, there's tsunamis, and then there's land, and animals are floating, and then they run across, they land, land up on a beach, and then they run across the beach, and immediately there's a new wave that brings in more sediment. I don't understand how that wouldn't disrupt those footprints and, and obliterate them, but I think their viewing is like it gets covered from up top really quick. And so what you'd have is a higher percentage of all the animals stepping and making prints, getting them preserved. Of course, there aren't as many animals because you're only talking about the animals that alive at one moment in time for the flood, right? That, that's, that's all the footprints you can make can only come from the animals that exist at that very moment of the onset of the flood. And so even if you grant that there's 100 million uh, vertebrate animals alive, you know, they're only going to make several billion footprints. And, but what I'm saying is there are billions of footprints in the fossil record, so virtually all of them have to be preserved. 
right? In other words, your preservation frequency has to be very high, like one out of 10. You know, one out of every 10 footprints laid down by an animal trying to escape the flood somehow gets preserved. That seems highly unrealistic. But let us, I'm going to grant you, let, let's actually grant you that, uh, that you could produce all those footprints in the geological column from the flood rocks by virtue of just the animals alive during that time and you had really high preservation rates. All right, so there's a difference between the old age and young earth model. Old age model, extreme rare preservation. New age, young age model, very, very high frequency of preservation. That's gonna, here's a problem. Have you, have you recognized what the problem is yet? Okay, here we go. Then you have the end of the flood. And then you have a whole bunch of sediments that are laid down on top with organisms that come from things that got off the ark, right? Like all the different canines. There are like 35 different species of canines, all your different sheep, all your different goats, all your different elephants, 160 different species of elephants, right? The younger creationist model has them being preserved on the, on the ark. And then they get off the ark and they spread across the world. And every footprint of an elephant that we have in the fossil record, lots of those, um, all must be from elephants that got off the ark. Right? So this means all of those footprints in the post-flood world, and I know you are skeptical of the billions of, uh, upon billions of footprints, but um, if you think that the flood boundary is at the KPG boundary, the 65 million year boundary, if you consider all the rock above that as being post-flood sediments, post-flood preservation, then there are surely billions upon billions of fossilized footprints, all right, preserved footprints. If, you th if you're more of an ICR, like late flood boundary, and that's really just the Pliocene left, I'm still going to say that there's a billion footprints all right, left there. All right, and I'm going to show you more of them in just a moment. Um, Lots of footprints. So now here's the thing. In the flood, you're saying like you had really high frequency of preservation, but now you're in a post-flood world. In the post-flood world, those rocks have as many, if not more, footprints in them than we see in the earlier fossil record. Right? In other words, the density of footprints in preserved rocks from more younger rocks, right? The Pliocene rocks or you know, Eocene and up rocks, right, have more footprint preservation in them than do older rocks, right? So now how did they get preserved? They didn't get preserved in a global flood, right? <laughs> so if they didn't get preserved in a global flood, you're still going to need, now you've got billions of footprints and they have to be preserved in less than 4,000 years, well, 4,000 years. So now you're going to have to maintain an exceptionally high preservation rate, like a really high percent, a really high percentage of the footprints laid down by the animals of each species have to be preserved in the fossil record. Right? That is that that's the conundrum. Right? That's the thing that speaks against the young Earth model right there, because you don't have a mechanism for that. You don't have a way of explaining that. In fact, as you came into this discussion, it appeared that you didn't really have that much knowledge of the post-flood preservation of, of, of footprints. Um, and, and it seemed like the way you were talking is, is that like the flood is the thing that's making, you know, is preserving footprints. And it's hard to imagine how footprints could be preserved otherwise. But what I'm saying is that there are as many, if not more, footprints preserved in non-flood, non-young earth creationist flood rocks. Um, and so that is the real challenge, is to explain those particular footprints. Okay, let's go, uh, rather than just be looking at this particular screen, let's go take a look at a few other, just, just a snapshot of a few other locations so we can talk about the challenges of some of these other footprints and just how amazing some of them are. Yeah. All right, let's try this out. I think that works a little bit better. Um, here is a, um, a, a set of elephant foot tracks, all right, from what is considered to be late Miocene rock. Now, if you're a late flood believer, right, the late flood boundary 
then this would actually be during the flood, right? So somehow a herd of very large elephants, as big as African elephants, right, is walking across some very large mud flat. Uh, I forget what the distance here is. You can't see it here, but it's like 2,000 feet or something like that, right? And this is, I think it was eight or nine elephants walking that way. And then you might not be able to see it very clearly, but there is a track going across here, a very clear set of tracks of a single individual. That single individual walks across the other tracks. And we know that because it came later because they're on top, right? You know, there's a whole bunch of tracks that are all contiguous. And then you have another layer of tracks that runs across that. Uh, and then running off into the distance, probably some like lone male, right? At a different time versus maybe a, a, a group of females, which is why this site's kind of interesting. It might tell us something about other elephant species and their herding. Uh, you know, down in the bottom corner, there's like just bunches of tracks. And then you'll see there's, there's this dark patch of rock here. That rock is at, at a higher elevation and it covers the tracks, but the tracks go under and then they appear on the other side. So there's no reason to believe that the racks aren't continuous underneath that rock. So then let's take a look at the, this next image here. So hey, here you can see the actual elephant tracks. Right? So, you know, that's the, the these things are huge, right? So that's where you get the idea of what the size of the elephant was. Um, but what I want you to see too is that uh, this layer TL1 over here, that is a thin layer of rock that's on top of all of this, right? So all this looks like it was a thin mud flat. Right? And then another layer of sediment got placed on top of that. And then if we look off in the distance, we see this large um, set of layered sediments, right? And there's like three different colors of rock here. So three different rocks with three different compositions, but they're all sedimentary rocks. Um, and this is repeated in other directions, all right? So there's these little pedestals around. So this is all material that hasn't eroded yet. Uh, so that indicates this entire area was covered with rock at least to the uh, as high as that particular rock over this entire area and it's been eroded and now we're finally seeing these elephant tracks and this is stone right this isn't this isn't hard dirt or hard mud this is stone here that these elephant tracks are in so possibly you might want to argue that this is actually during the flood of course if this is during the flood this is also above 10 thousand feet of sediments, right? 10,000 feet of sediments here had to be laid down. And then somehow these elephants appear as a herd, right? And they're walking across this mud flat. Now the, those sediments have to have been laid down. And if they were laid down really quickly, this is fine grain material. This isn't sand, right? This is like mudstone. That would have to be dewatered to the point where it wasn't just full of water, which, you know, if you go mix up some mud, right, and set it there, you're just going to sink right down into it. And an elephant, it's, this has to be very consolidated mud, right, clay, right? In other words, it has to be, 90% of the water has to have already been ex it squeezed out of it in order for these elephants to walk across and not just sink all the way up to their stomachs uh, in it. So that represents a good amount of time of this sediment sitting there. And then of course there's more sediments on top of that, and there's more sediments on top of that, and there's more sediments on top of that um, as well. So is this a post-flood group of elephants or a pre-flood group of elephants? Um, you know, that, that would be the, the kind of the mystery here. But either way you go, you either have preserved elephants after the flood that have departed from the ark, or you're preserving footprints of elephants during the flood. Now, here is a sand dune, preserved sand dune. This is all rock, okay? And these are sand dunes that are along the coast of the southern coast of South Africa. It's about uh, 75 feet tall. Uh, just bank of sand dunes, right? It's like a sand dune on top of a sand dune on sand dunes on sand dunes. It's like a giant sand dune field that's got multiple layers to it. Think Sahara Desert, right? Where there's areas where 
there is sand on top of old sand dunes on top of old sand dunes and a new sand dune on top of that, right? All of that is now consolidated and has lithified, turned into stone, right? And that's what you have here in South Africa. It looks like the bottom of Africa there was at one time a giant sand dune area. Um, and in these thicker layers of sand dune, all right, oh, let me back up just a second. You might be thinking to yourself, what about the Coconino sandstone? Right, young earth creationists have worked really hard to try to show that that particular, those sand dunes, which we would call, you know, fossilized sand dunes, you know, young earth creationists will claim that those were preserved underneath the water, like they were made under, during the flood, and they were not made as sand dunes in an, in an aerial environment. Right, so you might be thinking, hey, maybe that's what this is too. Maybe this is actually just kind of like the Coconino sandstone. Maybe this is these are all just subaerial, like or subaqueous uh, sand dunes. But here's the thing: when you go into these sand dunes, people have looked at a lot of these sand dunes, um, and they've looked through layers along the coast here. It's constantly eroding. And what do they find? This person is scooched up under, you know, the, the, the tide comes in and it's eroding out uh, these little caverns. Uh, and so these layers of sandstone are breaking off. And as they do, here are some sort of bulges sticking out the bottom of this sand. Uh, and they don't look like it from this particular angle, but these are footprints. And what they are is somebody stepped on the sand above, right, as this was a sand dune. Uh, and you can see this is an arch. This is like probably a, an area between sand dunes. And so somebody stepped there, right? And they pushed the sand grains down and it pushed the sand grains from one layer of sand that had been laid down, sort of pushed it into the sand grains from the, the next lowest layer, right? And each layer is demarcated slightly by a little bit different wind speeds, creating slightly different size sand grains and so forth. And that's where you're going to get your layers from. Um, and these are footprints, and not only are they just any footprints, these are human footprints. There's multiple places here where we have human footprints preserved on what's oddly enough the top of the cave. All right, so you're seeing the bottom of somebody's foot. Um, there's also all kinds of other animal footprints in these sand dunes, right? All vertebrate, land dwelling organisms that have stepped on these sand dunes and left their impressions on them. And so the way we explain that is like, here's a dune field and between the, the dunes, right, there's, a, there's sandy areas between them as the, dance, as the dunes are moving around, right? And one day it rains, somebody walks across that, presses that, that sand down in there, compacts it down in there, then it dries, it's blowing wind, more sand gets blown over into this, this um, area between the two sand dunes and covers up those particular footprints, right? But the depression is still left there. And the depression is, is precise enough for us to see the digits on the, on the ends where the toes are, right? Enough to say like, yes, that is, that's not just a primate foot, but that is a hominid foot. Right. We don't know exactly, you know, who that belongs to exactly in terms of like Homo malady or the various names or different hominids, um, but a very human-like footprint. So that is a really intriguing place because in this case, there's no way to explain this as being like a footprint laid down during a global flood, right? Are there other humans walking around on sand dunes during a global flood? Are there other animals walking on sand dunes during a global flood? This can't be pre-flood sediments because, again, there's thousands of feet of sediments below this, which are fossil-bearing beds, which would all be explained by young earth creationists as having occurred during a flood. So this sits on top of that, and yet it's all stone, right? So it's been around a while. Uh, you know, how long? How long? For young earth creationists, somebody had to get off the ark, they had to go to Babel, they had to leave Babel, they had to hoof it all the way down to South Africa, right? While there was sand dunes in this particular location, leave their tracks, and then you had to have another 60 feet of sand dunes pile up on top of these sand dunes, 
right? And eventually there's actually a whole soil layer and several other types of things on top of that. And then all that turns to stone, right? All that turns to rock. And then it's been eroding, right, since then, right? Eroding from the top, it's in size, there's valleys in it, and then been eroding from the ocean, which has been moving into and carving out uh, the side of this. Yeah, you know, now you have this uh, side view of what used to be a sand dune system. All right, so pretty cool location. I would say not easy to explain in terms of the historical context within a young earth creationist framework. And then we could just go to the flood real quickly. Um, and then you could look at hundreds of papers like this. Um, this is just a vertebrate fossil record from a place in Spain, right? And then they have like this column of like, here's all these different layers of sediments in this one valley in Spain. And there's a bunch of different locations where they found fossils, but they've all, you know, the, the layers are easily identifiable across the valley. Uh, and so there's four different levels at which there's dinosaur tracks, right? Spaced out with quite a bit of sediment in between. Um, so these wouldn't be thin layers between. These are like really thick gaps between. Uh, and then you have like five or six different species of dinosaurs that are living in this area. You have lots and lots and lots of uh, eggshells. You have partial nests that are preserved. Right, all these things suggest an ecology of a group of organisms living in this particular area over a long period of time, in which you have deposition uh, in a what is a floodplain, uh, and you just have layers and layers and layers of sediment being laid down. You have fossil, tr you have tracks, you have bones, you have eggshells, you have nests, you have, uh, you know, all the different types of remains you expect um, from these dinosaurs had they lived in the same area for a long time. Yeah. Okay. I that's that's enough. I mean, that's like I have a couple other examples, but I think that I think that's enough to make the point that um, it's not terribly difficult, right, to preserve footprints, right, especially when you have billions of them to work with, right. There's going to be times where there's going to be footprints left. I mean, uh, I haven't gone all, all over all the human footprint examples, but there are multiple locations in North America and hundreds of locations in Europe and other countries. Oh, and, and just think of the Laoti prints, right, in, uh, in Africa, right? Those are a very famous set of human or hominoid uh, footprints, and they were laid down in volcanic ash. So there you had brand new volcanic ash that's fallen from the sky, and somebody walked across that ash, compressing it, and then more ash fell on top of that, and you have preservation of footprints. Now, that doesn't require water, right? That didn't require um, you to have a flood in order to preserve those footprints. Now, eventually, that gets covered up with sediment. And then you do have water percolating through that, which helps that volcanic tuff, right, that ash, eventually get lithified into the type of rock that it is today. Um, and so, yes, there is an aspect in which water is involved but it's not necessary for it to be a flood or a you know voluminous amounts of water being involved. It's a terrestrial happening is what it is. All right, that's it. That's enough of uh, footprint preservation. Yeah, let's call it quits for the day. Hey, thanks for listening again. This is Joel Duff. I appreciate you um, hanging out on my channel here and listening to my babblings of the moment. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>